Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is absolutely wonderful to welcome all of you here to St. Faith's. It's a passion of mine that this building is not just a, a place of worship, but very much a place to welcome the whole community and to do with community events and concerts <coughs> and so forth. But we haven't had a public meeting here for some time, so I'm really, really delighted about that and delighted to welcome you all. Um, for those who don't realise who I am, I'm Tom, I'm the rector here, um, and that's why it's my privilege to welcome you, and also just to cover a couple of basics with you. First of all, uh, regretfully, the one limitation of this building um, is that it has only one toilet. Okay, so if you do find yourself in need, um, please make your way through the door over there in that corner, and then keep going until you find the toilet, which is in the, the final room through there, all right? It's just one, okay? Uh, sorry? Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. My general manager, Shelley, uh, wants me to point out, or you could donate to help us build our dream of, another, of a toilet at the back of the church, which we are very strongly intending to do, but we need to raise a bit more money. Um, secondly, fire regulations. I just need to uh, make sure we understand, should it be necessary, that what we ask is that everybody on this side of the building uh, would exit through that door and everybody on this side of the building exit through the rear door. That way we divide and conquer the fire. But I doubt that will be necessary and of course I will give directions if that happens. Um, I want to say a, f a particular welcome to uh, various agencies and uh, folks who are here. I'm not going to name you all, but I will just let you all know that, first of all, our leader of Haven't Borough Council is here, Alex Rennie, hiding behind a pillar, though he can see everything where he is from there. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Rosie, our mayor, who's in a, here in an unofficial capacity, but she is our mayor, and it's, it's wonderful that she's showing a, a real interest in this topic by being here tonight. And there are another, a number of other councillors and representatives from Coastal Partners, am I right? Yes, um, what's your name? Lop. Lop. Lyle. Lyle, thank you, Lyle. Lyle from Coastal Partners is here as well. Um, so, I'm gonna shut up in a minute. I just wanna give you one thought, because you've come to church, so you've gotta have a sermon, haven't you, yeah? Very quick thought. I'm a great believer that all religions, all religions, have pictures and stories and metaphors that can help us to live our lives better. And the one picture I've been talking about over those last couple of weeks, because we've had a, a series of events focused around green issues and, of course, Harvest Festival last week, is this. At the very beginning of the Bible, which is, of course, the tradition I know best, is the great myth of the creation story. I'm sure you know it. It's just one of at least three creation stories that are in the Bible, which is why I call it a myth. It's just a glorious picture. And in this glorious picture, God creates a garden. And in that garden, he places the man and the woman. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. you can imagine this as a garden, can't you? And what does God say to them? He gives them a single command. Take care of the garden. Yeah? Why don't you say it with me? Take care of the garden. Yeah? That was God's command to humanity, and it's one I hope we'll keep an eye on this evening. Yeah. Well, I don't know where that came from, but well done. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand us to our chairman for the evening. I will be popping around a bit because I'm doing some technical stuff. Oh, which reminds me, we are recording tonight's uh, event. Um, but only facing <coughs> this way. So if you come up and stand here, you will find yourself on a recording, but I will, we will not be recording anybody sitting there. Similarly, if you say anything, anything you say will be recorded and taken down in evidence and may be used against you at any point in the time, in future. Just thought you ought to be aware. So without further ado, our chairman for the evening, Ed Neville, please give him a round of applause. <clears throat> <clears throat> It's wonderful when you get applause before you do anything. It's somewhat better if it comes later. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for coming, because this tonight is a really, really important issue, not just for us down in Langston, but also for the whole of Havant, and I believe also for the whole of Hampshire. This is a really important issue, which I hope we will attempt to elucidate for you all. 
this meeting follows on from the previous one that we had at Langston Sailing Club uh, when we presented the stories that surrounded our mill pond and in particular, just to remind you, one particular part of it, the mill pond is actually a man-made artificial pond. However, it's been there for over 200 years. So to say it's <coughs> man-made and therefore doesn't matter is clearly wrong. And we will go on to say also that it was created with a dam which is now being called the sea wall. So if we talk about the dam or the sea wall, we're meaning the same thing. It is keeping the pond there. But we'll go on, our speakers will go on to talk about that in some detail. I would like to, to firstly ask Margaret, Margaret Tate, to come and talk to us. Margaret is a zealot, I think is probably fair to say, but in the nicest possible way. I can say that in a church, can't I? And she is somebody who is a great protagonist of uh, the preserving of the mill, uh, the mill pond, and I just invite you, Margaret, to talk as you did last time for us. Right. <coughs> Good evening. Right. My name is Margaret Tate. I have the dubious honour of being the instigator of the petition to save the sea walls and the pond. It's now five months since the public meeting was held at Langston, and as many of you may know, some, a lot of people had to be turned away. It was at full capacity even before the meeting started. So that's why we've got the meeting here, which can hold far more people. So I'll start with a potted history of Langston Mill. This lovely sketch came from an old postcard. <coughs> Excuse me. The mill is grade two listed a rare example of a windmill and a water mill. The original mill was built around 1730, and the mill pond has been here since the early 1800s, so it's over 200 years. So before we discuss this summer's activities, what has not changed? Repair of the sea walls is still being blocked by natural England, and this is because they don't want to set a precedent of repairing sea wall, of repairing the sea defences where lives or property are not at risk. Our campaign is therefore vital. Last April, <coughs> Councillor Lulu Bowerman sent rights of way officers to assess the path by the milk pond. And she said it was decided that the edge of the path would be rebuilt and the surface reinstated to its original width. But no date has been given to start work on this relatively short area, apart from saying it will be done before next year's local elections. <laughs> However, we believe that now Councillor Liz Fairhurst has taken on responsibility for repairing this section of the path. That is to say, only the section that is behind the mill by the pond. So, actions this summer, what have we done? We had a peaceful protest walk. That was held on Sunday the 14th of May and started from the Spring Car Park in Havant along the Billy Trail to the Royal Oak. We saw the fallen walls and the eroding footpath by the mill pond. Almost 200 people turned up, probably many of you, with placards, bagpipes, balloons and flags it was fun and peaceful. We had the same aim, to save the sea walls and the pond. Local press took photos and recorded interviews. An article was printed in the Portsmouth News with Councillor Alex Rennie holding a placard proclaiming, protect our pond. A local drone operator took a, a bird's eye view video of the many people on the protest walk. <coughs> The campaign now has the full support of Haven Borough Council. Alex Rennie, as leader of HBC, has said, our hands are effectively tied by frameworks dictated to us from a national level. We will continue to work with key stakeholders to the best of our abilities to secure the best possible outcomes for the harbour and our residents, unquote. 
But there has also been an encouraging quote from our MP, Mr. Alan Mack. He said, having seen the, mon <coughs> having seen the mill pond and sea walls, I want to see them protected. Once a plan is agreed, I stand ready to contribute to protect and enhance this much loved coastal environ environment, end of quote. So this next picture illustrates just what will be lost if the sea walls are not repaired or replaced, and if the dam fails. This would cause 15,000 tonnes of water and silt to gust onto the shore, and this would be irreversible. So then we had the action weekend. <coughs> this was held over the August bank holiday weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Each day from 11 in the morning until 4 p.m., several of us were at the site of the fallen walls doing head counts. On the bank holiday Monday, we counted 1,007 people in the five-hour stint and a total of 2,371 over the three days in total. I remember that was just in those five hours. We handed out updated news sheets, information on the bats and wildlife, and colouring sheets and an ice spy cha challenge for children. We had 100% support for the Victorian walls to be rebuilt or repaired. Many of the thousands of people who walk that stretch of path told us they had been to Langston as children, and now they bring their own children and grandchildren. Again and again, we heard, please don't let it be destroyed. Many people signed the online petition, bringing the total this evening to 4,182. The written petition now stands at 611. So that's 4,793. <clears throat> but it isn't just about the numbers. I'd like you to look at the heartfelt comments that hundreds of people have left on the petition, the change.org petition. The overriding comment is, please save Langston for the next generations. On the last day, we were approached by a man in a wheelchair who told us of his difficulties in getting across Poostick's Bridge because of the different levels. We approached Haven Borough Council and Alex Rennie's PA immediately reported the problem to Hampshire County Council. Within a week, the work to level up the approaches of the bridge was completed. So that was a win-win situation for us and Haven Borough Council, also for the wheelchairs. Some of you may not be aware of the bat colony here. They fly out at night in search of food. There are 11 bat species in a two kilometer area and two are very rare, the Barbastel and the Greater Horseshoe. Surely this is another reason why the mill pond should be treated as a special case and allowed to remain. Salt marsh does not support any of the insects that the bats need. Now there are two pubs at the water's edge, the Royal Oak and the ship, and they would likely lose much of their business were the path and the dam to fail. Many visitors enjoy a drink or a meal at these pubs as part of their walk around Langston. So this is another picture of Langston Mill showing the iconic beauty of this spot. Now this could be good news. Chichester Harbour Conservancy have commissioned an independent technical report or site survey from a Dutch company called Royal Haskonig into the state of Langston Harbour and the feasibility of repairing the sea walls. The report is due out in early October when it will be made public and will form the basis of Chichester Harbour Conservancy's decision making. We can only hope that it will focus on the historical, ecological, educational and amenity value of this unique place. We hope they will deliver a verdict in favour of saving Langston. So what action can be taken? Well, thanks to a very committed supporter of our campaign, a Facebook page has been set up for comments and pictures, and we'd like as many people as possible to share it on social media. To find the Facebook page, yeah, it should be there on the screen. So, nearly finished. To summarize our achievements this summer, 
We have secured the support of Alex Rennie and Haven't Borough Council. We have a Facebook page with 83 followers and it's growing daily. There are ever increasing numbers on the online petition. We have issued our first newsletter, others will follow. What next, I hear you ask? Well, firstly, we must wait for the results of the technical report due early next month. We can then decide on any further action to be taken. One last word. I try to remain hopeful of a positive outcome, but if the sea walls and the pond are lost through too many bureaucratic delays, then I will feel the dreams of almost 5,000 people have been washed away by the tide and storms, as there will be nothing to stop it. Once lost, it will be lost forever. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And it just respected uh, councillors and other important people. Emotion does matter as well. It's really important. So, Margaret, thank you for letting us see that. We'll move swiftly on. There'll be a chance for questions later, but I'd now like to invite uh, Gemma Nash to talk, who is also a Langston resident, uh, and is, as she spoke at the last meeting, and uh, is by way of being an expert on all sorts of things, but particularly on this matter now. So, Gemma, could I ask you for your follow-up from your last talk? Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Margaret. So I'm Gemma, a local resident. I spoke to some of you in April about the ecology of the Langstone Mill Pond and questioned the reasoning behind why there is no plan to repair the wall that runs between the Langstone Mill and the bottom of Wade Lane. Since April, despite strong support from the local community, little action has been made by the authorities involved. If the current inaction is pursued, the wall will fall, the mill pond will be lost, and the footpath will be lost. We will lose the habitats and the species which thrive in this unique environment. We will lose this beautiful heritage asset, the option to enjoy this social amenity and you will each lose your right of way to walk past here. The current mill pond is a 2.9 acre haven for wildlife. The sea wall forms part of the mill pond dam with the footpath sitting on top, the whole thing backed by a clay membrane retaining the pond water. Its waters occasionally become saline when exceptionally high tides cause the wall to be overtopped. This has led to a pond habitat and intertidal habitat, which is rare in the UK. Its size and seclusion make it a nursery for a wide range of species. And yet, this public amenity is also readily accessible for local people to enjoy. The inclusion of the mill pond and paddock in Havant Borough Council's Langston Conservation Area recognises the importance of this site the mill pond, the dam and the sea wall as an integral part of this important heritage site. So why aren't they protecting it? The authorities involved in the inaction so far include Chichester Harbour Conservancy, who ignored the summary of their own ecologic survey in December and will not acknowledge the value of this area that their own survey highlighted. They think that the harbour is more important and should expand in land irrelevant of what is lost. As Margaret mentioned, they have commissioned another survey, but their current plan is to reroute the footpath north, and they don't seem to mind that we will lose the entire stretch of Langstone's coastal footpath that forms part of the ancient Wayfarer's Walk, the Solent Way, and the new King Charles III coastal path. This small stretch of which over 100,000 people 
walk along each year. Natural England, a central government body, are also not fussed about us losing our access to nature and popular footpath either. Due to generic guidance, which doesn't take into account the specific case for this unique nature reserve, they also believe that Chichester Harbour is more important, so should be allowed to expand in land irrelevant of what is lost. Hampshire County Council are bowing to the generic guidance from Natural England and have so far not acted to maintain this footpath, despite them being assigned to do this under the Countryside and Rights of Way Act. Haven't Borough Council have pledged their support for maintaining the footpath and protecting this area, but they believe their hands are tied because of Chichester Harbour Conservancy and Natural England's policies. Coastal Partners, who advise the Council on coastal matters, has defined the Mill Pond Wall as a fixed coastal defence, despite the fact this wall is around one metre lower than coastal defences they build elsewhere, and the high tide regularly overtops this wall. Coastal Partners will not acknowledge that there are any habitats here worth protecting. So why do Chichester Harbour Conservancy and Natural England not want to protect this area? Here we have a long list of some of the relevant Chichester Harbour designations. The ones highlighted in blue are also shared with the mill pond. Primarily, Chichester Harbour is designated as a site of special scientific interest, a triple SI. Natural England reviewed the condition of Chichester Harbour and sadly found that the harbour is in a declining condition due to the loss of almost half of its salt marsh since it was given this triple SI designation. They highlighted a key reason for this as something called coastal squeeze, which is where, due to fixed coastal defences, there is a limited capacity for salt marsh to grow in land on higher ground in response to the rising sea levels. Removing the fixed coastal defences can allow the salt marsh and harbour to expand in land, also known as rollback which Tom will discuss in more detail. This is, a, this is an example of healthy salt marsh. As mentioned, the mill pond wall is too low to act as a coastal defence, and at, at the Langstone site acts as a terrace for some of the salt marsh species pictured here, something Tom will discuss in more detail later. And Nick has created an information board just on your way out um, for you all to take a look at if you'd like more detail on this. Contamination of the harbour water with thousands of hours of raw sewage is undoubtedly contributing to the declining condition of the Chichester Harbour triple SI. However, the Conservancy and Natural England don't seem to be targeting this with as much exuberance as their generic rollback policy. Without addressing both issues, arguably little progress will be made to improve the harbour's ecologic health. This picture was taken just west of the Langstone Mill Pond. The chalk stream fed mill pond provides a valuable, predominantly freshwater habitat for many of the harbour bird species to escape from the contaminated harbour, as well as acting as a freshwater stop off point for many small birds that rely on this chalk stream fed pond. In between this sewage outflow pipe and the mill pond, we have an example of a large area of land which has already been rolled back to expand the salt marsh in Langston and Havant. A breach in the seawall at Southmore led to the decision for unmanaged coastal retreat where habitats including a wild orchid field to the north of this site were lost and the coastal path here was diverted and now runs through an industrial estate to the north. A similar prospect for the footpath at the mill pond. Chichester Harbour Conservancy and Natural England, advised by their ecologic experts, allegedly will not acknowledge this huge area of rollback at Southmore because it is not technically within the bureaucratic bounds of Chichester Harbour, but it lies a few metres west on the edge of Langstone Harbour. With this map, I'm highlighting the strong tidal flow between Langston and Chichester Harbour, which are one body of water connected under the Hailing Island Bridge. 
The species here are the same. They are affected by the same factors. They benefit from the same factors. The proximity of other rollback areas meters beyond the Chichester Harbour border, but still within Langston and Havant, cannot be ignored. The Mill Pond and Paddock site, a relatively tiny area, has such a unique, valuable ecosystem, which hosts the species which use both harbours, many of which contribute towards the Chichester Harbour Triple SI designation. This site is so clearly different to other areas of land they are crudely comparing us to. This map shows the whole of Chichester Harbour. The larger red circle at the top left-hand side of this map shows the area of land lost to develop more salt marsh at Southmore. The smaller red circle next to this shows the proposed area they want to sacrifice at the mill pond, even without the ecologic, historic and social value of the mill pond. Chichester Harbour Conservancy is asking for Langston and Havant to sacrifice a disproportionately large area of land relative to the rest of Chichester Harbour. We do not see Emsworth, Chidham or Bosham rolling back any land to the scale that the Chichester Harbour Conservancy is pursuing in Langston and Havant, let alone sacrificing their most accessible, ecologically and historically valuable site and most popular footpath. There are other far more appropriate sites of low-grade agricultural land to roll back elsewhere in the harbour, which for some reason they are ignoring. Leveling up in Havant should be prioritised. Access to nature is a huge part of this. Maintaining this footpath is so important, considering the value of this site. How will losing this beautiful site affect your well-being, your mental health, your enjoyment of the Havant coastline, your ability to appreciate nature? Langston and Havant's sacrifice at Southmore should be more than enough to satisfy Natural England's policy here. This policy of no active intervention, in reality unmanaged realignment for the Langston Mill Pond, will destroy an established asset, leaving a mess which will take years to stabilise. 15,000 tonnes of water and silt would spill rapidly into the Chichester Harbour Triple SI if the wall falls, leaving behind a tidal environment in which the level of the former mill pond would drop by well over a metre at each low tide. None of the authorities who are pushing for us to roll back this area have carried out, as far as we are aware, any surveys on the effect to the harbour if the wall is allowed to fall. Have they tested the sediment in the mill pond? Have they assessed the ground level height of the base of the mill pond, the scouring effect of the fresh water and silt? And if either of these will support the salt marsh growth? Have they costed the removal of the mill, mill pond wall and the cost of a replacement boardwalk if this is even considered? The answer is worryingly no to all these questions. So this is the front page of the Conservancy's management plan for the area of outstanding natural beauty, which the mill pond and paddock are included in. Refusing to allow repairs to the wall which supports these areas is actively not protecting. It's actively not enhancing the landscape. Removing the footpath is actively removing our ability to enjoy this area. Here are more of the Conservancy's continuing values. Why aren't these values being upheld when it comes to haven't? Will allowing the wall to fall and the habitats to be lost here be protecting the beauty of the Langstone Mill Pond and Paddock landscape? Is unmanaged retreat going to protect the beauty of this important heritage site? This map of the Langstone Mill Pond sets out at least nine habitats here in this tiny site, many of which are priority habitats, which means they should be protected for biodiversity conservation. Does Chichester Harbour Conservancy and Natural England really believe that allowing over nine habitats to be lost here will benefit wildlife and benefit biodiversity? 
One of these priority habitats is the wet woodland to the north of the pond, which hosts the largest heronry in Chichester and Langston harbours. It was the first nesting site for cattle egrets in Hampshire and hosts the largest roosting site for little and cattle egrets. In the Conservancy's own report in December, they have highlighted the reliance of these harbour species on this wet woodland habitat. They should be protecting it, and they're not if they don't allow repairs to the wall. Allowing the wall to fall will lead to a sudden dramatic increase in salinity, leaving none of these habitats time to adapt. The wet woodland, for one, will die, and these nesting and roosting sites will be destroyed. This is going against the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which is a law the relevant authorities should be upholding. The Conservancy report in December, which they have chosen to ignore, I may have mentioned that, highlighted that the adjacent paddock next to the mill pond, also in the area of outstanding natural beauty, provides a habitat for wetland birds and should be considered functionally linked to the Chichester and Langston Harbour protection area. Many notable harbour bird species rely on this habitat, which will be destroyed if they do not repair the wall and footpath here. The pond and paddock host dozens of species. Here is a list of only some of the birds we see here that rely on the habitats of the mill pond. The reed beds on the edges of the mill pond that you can see in this picture house some of these birds. They are another of the priority habitats that should be protected, but will be destroyed if the wall is not repaired. The River Limbourne, which feeds the mill pond, is a rare chalk stream. David Attenborough has highlighted that chalk streams are one of the rarest habitats in the world. This wasn't even acknowledged in the Conservancy's December survey. By allowing the wall to fall and coastal erosion to continue, they are making an active decision to destroy part of this rare habitat. A recent eDNA survey confirmed that the European eel is a resident species of the mill pond. This is an exceptionally rare species. The number arriving in Europe has fallen by 95% in the last 40 years. This 250-year-old wall is unlikely to be contributing to this 40-year drop. The authorities should not be destroying the habitat this critically endangered species relies on. As Margaret mentioned, a recent bat survey identified many bat species in this area, including the Western Barbastel, another endangered species that is found in the mill pond habitat that we will lose if the authorities do not repair the mill pond wall. The loss of woodland habitat is one of their main threats, something which will be lost if the mill pond wall falls. There have been many sightings of the water vole in the mill pond over the years. This rare small mammal needs help to survive in the UK. The authorities should be protecting the habitat the water vole has been known to use, not destroying it by allowing the wall to fall. Going back to bureaucracy, one of the reasons the authorities won't protect the mill pond and paddock is because they were by some historic accident not included in the triple SI. The tiny Langstone mill pond is, however, defined as a site of importance for nature conservation a sink by Hampshire County Council. As defined by Hampshire County Council, sinks host wildlife and features that cannot be recreated. They support triple SIs as a vital component of the biodiversity of Hampshire. If the wall falls, the sink will be destroyed. Biodiversity will be significantly reduced. There is a huge overlap in the species which rely on the mill pond and also rely on the harbour. These areas support each other. Langston Mill Pond is a sink. Chichester Harbour is a triple SI. However, wildlife and habitats are not contained by these bureaucratic distinctions. Removing one will not benefit the other. The mill pond area is so clearly an inappropriate site to roll back if the argument is to benefit the triple SI. Allowing the mill pond wall to fall is not safeguarding the nature here. It is not enhancing the diverse range of habitats for the benefit of wildlife. A lack of accountability and oversimplification of bureaucratic distinctions by the authorities should not be used as an excuse to ignore valuable habitats and species. 
These experts, who should have a duty of care, should be able to appreciate the subtleties of the environment they are assigned to protect. Net biodiversity loss is the only outcome of sacrificing this ecologic jewel. So I'm going to end on this aerial view of Langstone with a final quote from Chichester Harbour Conservancy. If they do not support repairs to this wall, they will be actively deciding to reduce access, to reduce understanding and reduce appreciation of the historic environment and heritage assets of Chichester Harbour. The cost of the environmental, social and historic damage that will occur if nothing is done to repair the wall is far higher than the cost of repairing this relatively short 300 metre stretch of wall. In the words of David Attenborough, nature is in crisis, unite behind action to save it. We need each and every one of you to actively engage with and encourage the authorities to stand up and fight the case for a solution which preserves the habitats, heritage and amenity of Langston to encourage the Conservancy to live up to their values and work with our Havant community to enhance, protect and enjoy this incredible site before it is lost forever. We've got some very powerful speakers in Langston, I tell you, that's fantastic. <clears throat> I'd like to move on now, and our, our last speaker should be Peter Oliver, who's also a very uh, senior resident of ours and extraordinarily knowledgeable about this, but he's unfortunately unable to give the talk tonight. So Father Tom, if he's around somewhere, I believe he works here, I'm told, Father Tom is going to speak on his behalf as he miracles somebody out of the woodwork Father Tom, drum roll, but no Father Tom, says he. Hang on, there's a distant, disembodied voice. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Trying yeah. to push buttons back there so that um, the recording needs of tonight no can be no further introduction. <laughs> So, as uh, Ed has explained, and I just want to underline uh, everything I'm about to say are not my words, they are Peter's words, Peter Oliver, um, and, uh, but I'm uh, honoured to present this part of the uh, presentation on his behalf. Peter starts, this meeting tonight is a follow-on from the sailing club, so what we'd like to do is recap what went on there and take forward the unanimous support that we received at that meeting. And to ask our elected representatives, scattered around the room, to produce an action plan. We seem to have not made any progress. And there appears to be many conflicting messages suggesting that there is no way forward. So we're trying to cover what we understand to be our elected representatives and, and what their advisers are saying and to urge them to listen to what we are saying. So why are we here? The seawall collapsed in March 2022. That's 18 months ago. We seem to be in paralysis since then and we need to break that deadlock. Peter defines this as what he calls mission conflict. The public want to preserve the pond and the local authorities' mission is to serve the public. The other agencies prioritize salt marsh. So can we satisfy anyone or everyone? So why is there paralysis? There seem to be, in Peter's view, too many agencies with a finger in the pie and insufficient understanding of the facts on the ground. And perhaps worse, any examination of the consequences of where their principles might lead them. Haven't MP Alan Mack has urged all parties to cooperate and believes that the local authority has all the power it needs 
which is a view I'm sure Alex will be keen to address later. We really need, says Peter, to recognize who is the decision maker. We need to rely on the local authority planning processes themselves, which are at their disposal, to assess the contending options. We believe that it looks like this. Haven't Borough Council and Hampshire County Council share the responsibility? Natural England and Chichester Harbour Conservancy and DEFRA have all been consulted. The former two, that is Natural England and Chichester Harbour Conservancy, are unsupportive, whereas DEFRA, on the other hand, has committed £35,000 in the current budget and promised a further £600,000 in future budgets to protect this environment. We were really heartened to see the support that was given at Margaret Tate's protest walk from Alex Rennie as the leader of the council and Richard Stone uh, and Liz Fairhurst, who holds cabinet responsibility for coastal affairs. I've seen uh, both Alex and Richard here. I don't know if Liz is here. Are you, Liz? Yeah. Oh, there she is, hiding over there. Thank you. Good, good to know you're here, Liz. Richard goes on, HBC, Haven't Borough Council, and have, uh, Hampshire County Council need to work within the framework of the law. And the so-called consenting guide, uh, a legal guideline on how these kinds of decisions should be made. That consenting guide, Peter says, describes where they are exempt from seeking any other agency's approval. And, of course, the corollary of that, where they need it. The only restriction on their power is if the remedial work should alter the height or spatial dimensions of the existing wall. Otherwise, in Peter's view, they are not constrained. They even have the power to grant permissions to other people to do the work or for them to go out to tender directly, which is what we want to persuade them to do. Any other interpretation of the consenting guide would set us on a never-ending circular discussion, which we think is the cause of the current paralysis. What any owner of a problem needs to achieve a solution is to have authority, the responsibility and the resources to complete the task. Alex Rennie has assured us on the protest walk that he has all three, the responsibility, the authority and the resources. Where the planning process might come in useful is that it has a well-tried discipline. It would shine some light on the discussion and bring clarity to the subject. The proponents of the three options could submit their plan. Their plan to either do nothing, let nature take its course, a plan to remove the wall, a radical intervention, or as we favor, to repair the wall. We think the planning process could clarify where we are and where we want to be and resolve any mission conflicts between ourselves and any advisors. These are the inhibitors for making progress. Understanding them is helpful in finding a way forward. We understand the need to promote the salt marsh. We understand the need for managed retreat, which would necessitate rolling back the sea defences and footpath, and we recognize coastal squeeze. We have no quarrel with any of this. Our differences are in the evidence and the execution. Now, having read these notes before, I'm just going to warn you, it gets a bit technical here. All right? So stay with me. And uh, thankfully, Peter is here to explain anything I don't get right. So what is salt marsh? This is what it looks like, and the credit goes to the World Wildlife Fund. This quote from the World Wildlife Trust describes the better grade of salt marsh and where it grows. 
elevation is key to this. The height above the sea, that is. And the gradient of the saline environment. The high quality stuff grows only well when it's above mean high water. Now, if you walk along the footpath at Langston, you can see the presence of sea purslane on the seaward side. And you can see samphire in the paddock, suggesting that the existing environment is conducive to salt marsh growth. And we have to remember that we are in a transition where sea levels will rise further and encourage salt marsh to penetrate further into the paddock. There is no contention between SSSIs and sinks that Gemma uh, so helpfully explained just now because they both enjoy protective status. The only difference between them really is academic. These charts, now we get very technical here, and Ed is, Ed is poised with his long stick to help us to understand this. These charts uh, show coastal partners' contribution to understanding what coastal squeeze might be. However, the narrative behind these charts is about shoreline squeeze only. So just to walk us through them, um, I'm just going to, to try to explain. So on the, where are you? You're on the right-hand side. This, yeah, uh, on the left-hand side, I'm sorry. On the left-hand side, we can see uh, the, what would happen as sea um, salt marsh grows above the waterline, above the mean waterline, and how, as the water progresses, it also pushes the salt marsh back as the height of the water progresses, remembering we're in a period of global sea rise. But on the right-hand side, coastal partners suggest that the imposition of the sea wall prevents that salt marsh from going inland. Yeah, have, that, have I said that correctly, Peter? Yeah? Good. Okay. Right. This diagram shows, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, this chart shows that the coastal squeeze describes the shrinking habitat for salt marsh vertically. It happens when the sea levels rise, as they are at the moment. It's independent of the shoreline. This would happen out in the channel uh, as, uh, you know, of Chichester Harbour as much as on the shoreline. And if you look around the harbour, the islands of salt marsh are disappearing or their quality is deteriorating. What you see now is mainly the Spartina grasses that can survive below mean high tide. Coastal squeeze is not confined to the shoreline. It's everywhere. The little stretch of Langston, 300 metres, is less than one twenty thousandth, one twenty thousandth, thank goodness I got good dentures, of the joint harbour's shoreline and would be insignificant if it actually presented a barrier to the spread of salt marsh inland. But the fact is, Peter says, it does not do that. Our seawall's role has changed from being just a seawall to a terrace at around the five meter tide level. We need to recognize that everywhere is in transition. The seawall is now fulfilling a constructive purpose which is in line, Peter argues, with Natural England and Chichester Harbour Conservancy's main concern. The insistence that the seawall should go is therefore utterly perverse in Peter's view. Many of you weren't born in 1946, although looking around, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> but, but those who lived through the war know that petrol was rationed and only available to essential users. Sea level rise is the result of our changed way of life and our widespread and enormous expansion of the use of fossil fuels. The image on the right far better describes 
uh, sorry, the image on the right describes far better the coastal partners' plans to holding the line to protect lives and property. This line runs north from the Royal Oak and passes Mike Gilbert's property. We hope that these plans come to fruition. The height of this hard defence would be the equivalent of tides up to 6.1 metres. It's easy to see that it would be wrong to describe the seawall belonging to Mill Pond Dam as being a sea defence at all any longer. This slide... Oh, did I jump one there? Yeah, I think I did. No? There we go. This slide shows where the salt marsh is currently growing, where mean height water is currently below 4.75 metres, well below Coastal Partners' proposed hard defence further west, around the pubs. We recognise its new role as a terrace, promoting salt marsh growth. We're not proposing any new sea defences, but rather that simply the wall should be rebuilt. This explains where salt marsh grows. It grows at the upper intertidal limits. It grows on nearly flat terrain, in slow-moving and brackish water. It's mainly in dry, open areas with full sun exposure, places where you also find eel. These characteristics can be found in the Langston Pond, but salt marsh will disappear Peter argues, if the dam wall is removed. Now, I don't think he means the dam wall. Because <laughs> he wouldn't say such a word in God's house, I'm sure. Oh, have I missed one? Ah, yes, there we are. This slide looks at the seawall's role as part of the industrial architecture, which allowed our forebears to harness energy to drive the water mill. The wall, the path, and the pond enclose an earth bank which needs to remain dry. The same forces that our forebears used to harness energy when they read by candlelight are the same forces which are destroying the wall at the north end of the path. They harnessed potential energy by raising the mill pond level and releasing it in the form of kinetic energy to drive their mill. That same kinetic energy is released from the saturated paddock. And this has caused forces to be exerted behind the seawall, which were never contemplated in its original design. It explains why this section of the wall collapsed in 25-foot slabs of brickwork toppled over as the tide receded. The paddock floods maybe seven times a year now, and over the course of the next 50 years, the frequency of flooding will increase to approximately 210 times each year. But anyone who's seen on the news the, the dam in Libya collapsing or in other similar events in third world countries will be aware of what damage kinetic energy can cause. Peter says we need a plan in place to protect the terrace from collapse, which protects the pond habitats for our grandchildren and their grandchildren. But we are told that cannot be because the sink designation is inferior to those of the SSSI, Ramsar and SAC. I don't know what they mean, but I hope you do. That simply, says Peter, is not a good reason. Our observation is that the pond and the harbours are one. They play a complementary role to each other. The wildlife which is bred and fledged in the rich biodiversity of the pond spread their wings and spend much of their adult life in the harbour. They enrich the harbour wildlife. The herons and the egrets return to roost and nest in the skeletal remains of the trees which have died in the newly saline water. 
these wide-winged waders choose this habitat because those trees have died during the natural transition caused by rising sea level. The pair of swans are parents of more than 50 offspring, and many of those adults grace the waterside in Emsworth. Nature, says Peter, does not recognize the bureaucratic boundary between the harbor and the pond, or the sinks and the SSI, or the supposed weight of the designators. The other area where Chichester Harbour Conservancy stance is, in Peter's word, perverse, is that the designation applies to the whole harbour, but the species which earn that designation are critically absent from the near shoreline. Coastal or shoreline squeeze ensures this is a hostile environment, both to those species and the salt marsh. Getting rid of the dam complex will only extend the barren post-coastal squeeze environment to where the Langston Mill Pond and the Jewel of Havant once stood. All for, in Peter's view, a dogmatic and misguided principle. The salvation, he says, is in the details. This is why we rely on the wisdom of our elected representatives to use their power and discretion in this matter. And if they have any doubt about what I'm saying, they have the processes which can sort the truth from the bureaucratic nonsense. So, he says, exercise them. In conclusion, all parties' objectives, all parties' objectives are best served by working with rising sea levels, working with rising sea levels, working with nature, and starting from observing the current evidence to forecast the future. We believe this leads to the conclusion that keeping the dam, its terracing, and the pond provide better conditions for the evolution of the upper salt marsh and salt marsh habitats. But conclusions, he says, are useless without actions. The action we need is for Haven't Borough Council and Hampshire County Council to reclaim ownership of the Langston Mill Pond issue, which could best be served by inviting marine engineering companies to submit tenders to functionally restore the terrace barrier and stabilize the protected intertidal area within the consenting guide restrictions. They should do this directly relying on the marine engineering skills of the successful bidder. I think we have a a medical emergency taking place. If there's anybody with medical training, Rosie, well done. I'm going to continue. Um, I, I know that those are competent medical people. They should do this Sorry? Yeah? Sorry? He's with with the GP. Good. Okay. Who was trying to summon me? (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'll continue. I'll continue because we don't all want to focus on... on As an aside, I'm a part-time consultant physician, but I stopped going to cardiac arrest some 40 years ago Mm. for very obvious reasons. Um, I'm too old. <laughs> you know there's a box in there, yeah? Just make, I just want to make sure that we've... Uh, we, uh, Shelley knows where there's a, there's a medical box in there. Okay. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> well, well, we weren't quite counting on that, I have to admit. <clears throat> right. Okay, I've nearly finished. Yeah. <laughs> So what Peter's arguing is that HBC and HCC need to reclaim ownership of the mill pond issue. And he suggests inviting marine engineering companies to submit tenders to functionally restore the terrace barrier and to stabilize that protected intertidal area within the consenting guide restrictions. They should do this directly relying on the marine engineering skills of the successful bidder, as the council has lost most of its skills to the coastal partnership, and they have their hands full with the complexity of their core project. 
HBC, he says, should then submit the winning bid to planning. If this doesn't satisfy Natural England or Chichester Harbour Conservancy, they should similarly be invited to submit their plans for the removal of the Mill Pond Wall. And if there is any sponsor for doing nothing, then they need to come forward and do the same. When judging the bids, they may include their usual criteria, environmental impact, 10% biodiversity gain and cost, so that all can see the full consequences of each course of action. I and Peter leave you with this picture on the cover of the Langston Ecology Report for which we waited over last winter. We want to continue experiencing the harbour's motto, enjoying, protecting, enhancing this unique area, rather than allowing any agency to commit the environmental vandalism they propose. Thank you. Peter, Peter stand up. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tom. Before we invite questions, we have almost entertainment. Simon. Hmm. Yes. Oh, right. A musical interlude. All right. You might, uh, as, as, while Simon sets up, you might want the opportunity just to stand and stretch uh, and, and just uh, let the blood flow uh, for a moment. <laughs> Don't go away, though. Yes, don't leave. <laughs> now it's time for questions. The most important part well, is yet after, to come. After music. Yes. Hmm. I just need to go and turn them OK, you're ready to go. OK, would you like to take your seats again, please, ladies and gentlemen? Can you save the discussion till later? Alex? Of course, yeah. OK. okay. Simon Cassimol has an appropriate song for the evening. I wrote it uh, a while ago um, as a stroll from Langston to Warbington Castle. Um, I, I write a, a fair amount of, of songs about the local area and history, and this one um, seemed particularly apposite because of the collapse of the sea wall and the description of the wall. So I put it on the Facebook page and then went to one of the uh, events over the August bank holiday and sung it down at the uh, end of Wade Court and then was invited to come and sing it tonight. And because it's a walk or a stroll along the beach, I think it encapsulates that this issue is a human issue. We've heard a lot of science this evening, uh, a lot of facts and figures, but fundamentally it's a human issue because it affects all of us and those of us, those who are to come in the future. Because we've all taken walks down there with our children and grandchildren. So this is a song called Where the Springs Run to the Sea, because as you know, Havant is built on springs, so I won't uh, go through the history of that. Uh, I understand there are something like 14 springs in Havant running to the sea, only one of which is visible now at Homewell. And I think you'll catch on with the chorus, and if you feel like joining in, please do, where the springs run to the sea. And I will go where the springs run to the sea, I will go where the wind sings through the reeds, I will go. Where the tide rolls in and out, I will go, I will go, I will go. 
I will go, I will go, I will go. At the western edge of the harbour, the hill stands tall and true, gazing at the beauty of that wild wetland view. And the royal oak has stood there three hundred years or more, welcoming kind strangers and those who like to call, and I will go. Where the springs run to the sea, and I will go. Where the wind sings through the reeds, and I will go. Where the tide rolls in and out, I will go, I will go, I will go. I will go, I will go, I will go. Strolling past the mill pond, signets growing tall. Listening to the oyster catcher's loud and piercing call. And you reach the end of Waycourt, where it runs into the sea. Sitting on the bench and blowing in the breeze, and I will go. Where the spring up to the sea, and I will go. Where the wind sings through the reeds, and I will go. Where the tides roll in and out, I will go. Like guardians of food claim Where the Hurstwood gang used to land Their ill-gotten gains And hiding from the excise man They hold it up the track With tales of ghosts and kidnapped To keep the people back And I will go Where the spring run to the sea And I will go Where the wind sings through the reeds And I will go Stand in faded majesty, witness to the Civil War and King Henry's history. Rooks and starlings gather round the castle and the keep. Sailors watch the landmark, sailing up swear deep, and I will go. Where the spring run to the sea, and I will go. Where the wind sings through the leaves, and I will go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's our rabble-rousing song, so thank you very much, Simon. That's brilliant. Um, we're going to invite questions now, and what I'd like to, to ask you, Tom, Tom's got the microphone, the roving mic, but I'd like you to say who you are and who you represent. And Alex, I believe you want to come first to you? Yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. Alex Rennie, who's been much quoted this evening, so he wants to have right of reply, quite rightly so. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all for um, coming to this evening. Um, I do appreciate um, the, the show of support and the room start really does underline how much an important issue this is for the community, not just in Langston, but across wider Haven. And it is also the reason why myself, as, as a, one of the local councillors and leader of the council, have taken such an active role in trying to work with you and really working with the community to try and deliver a solution. Because ultimately, we want what you want, um, particularly amongst me and my councillor colleagues, we absolutely want to protect and save the, the Langston seawall and the, and the mill pond, because we, we absolutely believe in the vital habitat. So I really want to thank Margaret for your continued work on this. It, it really has been inspirational to see what you're doing and galvanising the support of the community. It's absolutely fantastic. And also for Gemma um, for all of her insight into the environmental um, side of things. I, I do want, though, to just push back on some of the things that Peter said, because um, as, as I see them, um, they're simply not true, I'm afraid to say. Um, we have um, a, a letter, and, it, and I'll read in black and white a letter I received from the Environment Agency when we asked them the question, and it's published on, our, on the website of the Coastal Partners, 
um, regarding whether we would be able to undertake work. And I quote from the letter that was sent to me from the Environment Agency, which says, work undertaken without necessary permit would constitute unlawful activity. So I cannot put my officers in a position to undertake unlawful work, which is the reason why we will absolutely keep pressing and working hard to gain the necessary consents from the Environment Agency, from Natural England and the Chichester Harbour Conservancy, who, who were here earlier but have, 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 have dashed off. Um, and that's where our focus and work is on. We are not going to pursue um, what we see as unlawful activity, what's been, been written in black and white as unlawful activity. You may, Peter, put forward points in your slides. I have to work with advice from my officers who have huge amounts of experience in coastal management and coastal law, and they have told me that we need these consents. So I will work on getting those consents, um, but unfortunately I, I cannot undertake any work without getting those consents, and I can't expect my officers to be in, in that situation. And a, and a final point, is we mentioned tonight a few times about coastal partners, and I want to clarify who coastal partners are. Coastal partners are um, essentially an, an arm of, of our council. It's an it's inter-fority agreement. So they manage the coastline on behalf of us, Chichester, Portsmouth, Gosport, um, so all along the, the Solent coast. Um, they are Havant Borough Council employees. We are actually the host authority of Coastal Partners. So whilst Coastal Partners are uh, slightly separate from the council in one sense, they are very much our officers and they, they, they deliver coastal work on behalf of us. So therefore, Lyle, who's here tonight, is head of our Coastal Partnership. He's one of our officers at the council. He's our executive head of Coastal at the council. So he's very much working in line with us on, on the same page. So... I do really want to say thank you all for coming. We are on your side very much. We want this to happen. We are going to be keeping on working with all of the relevant authorities. I think there's a way forward. We have secured some money, as mentioned earlier, from DEFRA in terms of having an investment and adaption strategy. I think if we have something like that in place, it can show exactly what we have talked about tonight or what the guests have talked about, the speakers have talked about tonight, which is about showing that coastal rollback shouldn't be taking place ad hoc when sea defences fail. It is completely and utterly wrong. It should be done in a managed way across the harbour. And we're making that clear point on your behalf. I could not believe more strongly on this point that it should not be left to, to where sea defences fail, where coastal rollback happens. So thank you for your support and thank you, Margaret, for everything you're doing and keeping up the fight. Okay. Uh, Tom, can you just say who you are and who you represent, if anybody? Hi, um, it's Penny from Langston. Um, I looked at Alan Mack's Twitter today, and it actually says on it, Parrot Borough Council has permissive powers in law to maintain coastal land. Is that incorrect information? I think so. Perhaps you should stay at the microphone. Um, I can't say it's not my meeting, but I'm asking So it is absolutely true we have permissive powers, but we also have, despite having permissive powers, we still need consent to undertake those permissive powers. So on the one hand, he is true. Yes, we have permissive powers. We're not denying we have permissive powers. But in order to undertake those permissive powers, we need relevant consent from the relevant agencies. And I read you out the direct quote from the Environment Agency, which said, undertaking work without the relevant permits would constitute unlawful activity. OK, thank you. Sorry? How long would a permit take? Um, I say I, I'm not I'm not an expert on on sort of co the coastal rules regulations, and obviously I rely on sort of, sort of the the advice I receive from my officers. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if we can get them to, to agree, there's no reason I'm looking at the law that we could start work right away. I mean, we just need them to provide the consent. So I'm not I'm not sure of the legal process. So I need to go to my officers to to answer that question. Sorry, where was that? Somebody started speaking, but I can't... Oh. Thanks, Lyle. Yes? 
Please use the mic because we won't hear Hang you. Hang on a minute. Lyle's going to try and answer some of those questions, I think, as long as he does it quickly. So we've got permissive powers under the Coast Protection Act to protect people and property. We need to demonstrate a technical, economic and environment sustainable solution. So we have those powers. But we also need to have all the other permits, permissions, comply with other legislation before we can act. We can apply for a permit from the Harbour Conservancy, a licence from the Environment Agency, and seek assent from Natural England if we don't need planning permission. I would say 12 weeks to actually turn that, those approvals around, but we've been told by all three of the people that approve those permits, licences and consents that it's unlawful and we will not ha be able to secure those consents. That is why we are lobbying with the leader of the council, those agencies, at the most senior levels, the minister wrote to us to confirm it would be unlawful to act without the permits, that we can't secure the permits, to try and look for a longer term plan, an investment and adaptation plan that respects the heritage, the landscape that we all love in Langston. So we are doing our best as a council coastal partners, officers of the council, to make the right choices for Langston Mill Pond for the future in the context of protecting the wide, wider environmental interests of Chichester Harbour. So I, w I really want us to actually think about Natural England's advice to us on all of our watch, we are not doing very well from an e ecological environmental position of any of our harbours, Langston Harbour, Chichester Harbour. We all need to do better. So okay. I, I, if I can just finish, because if we are this passionate about Langston Mill Pond, I would encourage you all to be equally as passionate as I am of the whole of Chichester Harbour and all our environment, and we need to do better, all of us. Thank you. Question over here, Ed. Ed, I'm over here. I'm by the door. Sorry, oh, over there, and, uh, Tom. Yeah. Thank you very much again. I'm oh, sorry, it's Louise, and I'm from Havant. Sorry. Sorry, my name's Louise, and I'm from Havant. Um, that was a very eloquent answer, and a lot of information I hadn't heard before. Why would you need planning permission for something that has already been built before? Could you possibly delve into the more technical side of that as well, please? Do not need planning permission, Lyle is saying. Unless you're built, you, you understand, to repair it, you don't need planning permission. But we need consent from Natural England and assent. I, the, I think the key question here is how can we help our councillors, as you've just heard, to pressurise the government or Natural England or the environmental agency or whichever is the decision making to actually change their advice to be able to make them think this is actually legal and not illegal and I don't know the answer to that. Phil. Oh, Phil. Yeah. Councillor Phil Mundy. Thank you. Just three specific things that are just not necessarily major but I think they would make a difference. First thing is we need to make a business case for why it's important to keep the mill pond. And making that puts it in our hands when anything happens, we're already ready with a business case. Wouldn't be a big job, because I'm not suggesting it would be very detailed, but we should be, be clear about the impact on the Royal Oak and the impact on the ship. And, and I think that will be worth doing. Second, second thing, um, we should ask uh, our legal department to be looking at any precedents for this. There will, I am sure, be cases where Natural England have not, um, have, ex have accepted an exception. There is one in Gosport, I believe, and I know it's different because that's not an SSSI, but there is one already. There will be others in places like Northumberland. Um, this advice was not mine, I have to say. It was Michael Wilson who suggested this because he's, and he was the ex-leader of the council. But he's also a solicitor. And he said, if you want to do something, make sure you've got your precedents set up because you can then argue with those. And the third thing, I think, is very publicly to ask our, ask our MP to speak to the minister. Because the, more, the higher we go, the better chance we've got of putting leverage. At the moment, he's broadly supportive, but we could ask him formally to go to the minister and plead our special case. 
And that's three things that we could do. Thank that you. Would just help. Thank you. So, business case precedent and go to the minister. I like it. Yes, hello. My name's Owen Funkett. I'm not really representing anybody, but I am a member of the Association and the Wildlife Trust and many other relevant bodies. Um, there's many reasons why I support this campaign, but as a rambler, we're very proud of the fact we're responsible for instigating the Round Britain coastal path. And of course, this is very much affected. And I think, you know, that's just, and obviously, if it is diverted, it, it'll be a very inferior path. So I think that's an important part of the argument. Thank you. Gentlemen. Hang on, hang on. This, this chap had his hand up next. <laughs> yeah, it's just a small point to follow on from what... Sorry, you are, sir, you are? Can you hear me? Yes, who are you? Uh, yes, my name is Ian Taylor. I'm a retired scientist from Nottingham University. I've been visiting this area for a long time and have finally moved down here. So I've done the walk to Langston on many, many occasions and I think it's really beautiful. I think it's, this is an absolute tragedy that's happening here. But having walked the route from Emsworth to the Royal Oak uh, for a couple of pints on many occasions, as I say, um, I've noticed some developments that fit into the category of precedent, I would have thought, which as far as I'm aware, nobody's mentioned, which is to do with Norbarn Woods in Emsworth, where there's a sloping terrace protecting the woods. And some of my walks in the past, there have been diggers on that site actually repairing that particular terrace to allow the sea to not destroy the rest of it and erode away. Norbarn Woods, where there's actually a footpath going through the woods close to the edge of the sea. Now, there must be a precedent there, surely. Somebody must have had permission to get these diggers onto the Norbarn Woods site. And I suggest that somebody looks into that, find out what permissions were given, and use that as a precedent. Thank you. <laughs> jo Anne, and then back there. I don't know whether you can hear me, can you? Uh, I suggest that you read... And you, and you're, and she's Anne Griffiths and she lives in Langston. <laughs> uh, I suggest that you read the Salt Marsh Restoration Handbook online, which was published for the Environment Agency in 2021. It states that it is no exaggeration to say that the success of salt marsh regeneration projects depends on the relationship you have with the local community. Enabling water to come closer to communities can create feelings of unease with possible impacts on people's livelihoods. It is essential to establish a lasting relationship with local relevant groups and not to push through a project they do not want. <laughs> Passions are running high. Oh, I'm not sure I should give Alan a microphone. I'm not sure what he'll do with it. Uh, I'm Alan Hakim. I used to live in Langston. I now live in Wade Court. So I'm very much a user of the path. I was going to bring up the whole question of precedent, but the last two speakers have got there before me. Uh, the point is that we're dealing with bureaucrats. We've had a most wonderful array of facts why they should repair the wall. But bureaucrats want precedent above all else. Don't bother us with facts. What will I have to permit if I permit this? And it might be in Northumberland or Cornwall. They'll still worry about that. So they, there's, you've got to find a loophole. Now, we've had one or two cases of recent precedents nearby. And there's also the fact that you brought up the idea that this wall is not really a wall, but a terrace. If you can create that as something that doesn't create a precedent, then you may be able to... It's win. echoing down here. It's a problem, yeah, I know, but it's echoing down here. You can hear it there. Uh, can you, is that okay? Can you hear me? Sorry, Mike Gilbert, I, um, 
I live next door to the mill pond. I don't know if that makes any difference. Um, I've got here the 1983 report that was done for the then owner of the mill pond um, and their recommendations on a management plan which should have been implemented over the last 40 years or whatever it is. Um, additional conservation work is required to maintain the mill pond which was recently acquired by a new owner occupier of the old mill. Discussion should take place to assess the extent to which the authorities are able to assist the owner in the execution of his plans. Chichester Harbour Amenity Area Management Plan, Chichester Harbour Conservancy, April 1983. Yeah. <laughs> Chairman? You've had one go. <laughs> I'm not going to be reserved and proper about this because the point is that all the while we're talking, the sea is coming, the sea will not wait for us, and so therefore all the excuses about getting this permission and that permission and the other permission will be just swept away. And that is my warning to you from the senior citizens. That was Beryl Francis, by the way. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sue Tinney, and I'm part of uh, the campaign. Um, I thought it was... Sorry? Oh, um, I thought it was most pertinent last night on the 10 o'clock Radio 4 programme that the RSPB report on the state of the, state of the nature situation in the UK, which links in 60 conservation charities, one of which is Natural England, believe it or not, and this report states that the UK is currently classified as being the most depleted natural wildlife country in the world. The crisis is now urgent. Then I picked up another quote. Theresa Coffey says we have put in place laws to protect species and wildlife to halt the decline of nature. Conflicts are obviously going on somewhere. But I found at the end of that particular news item the relevance and the resonance that this report has for our iconic and special biodiversity arena that we have on our doorstep. And we do have to get on and get something sorted out. So please read that State of Nature report published by the RSPB. Chairman, the Chairman's given you a second crack at the whip. It's Penny again from Langston. Um, just an add-on to the business model that you were talking about, the businesses that would be directly affected by the lack of footfall to the area aren't just the two pubs in Langston. I meet frequently as I'm walking around the shore people who've come to stay on hailing in order to walk around this beautiful area. So the business model should include the hotels that will be affected by people that will no longer come, the tea rooms, the, the, the cafes, the pubs, all of those places on Hailing where people come to visit, to come here to Langston, which they consider to be part of Hailing. So the business model expends much further than just the two pubs in Langston. my exercise for the day today. Thank you, Tom. It's uh, Bob Comlay from Haven't Civic Society. I think what I'd just like to bring a bit of perspective here in that I've lived here for 40 odd years, more than that, brought up three children here, and uh, even my grandchildren have been over from the States and walked the mill pond. Um, it's one thing we're losing sight of here is that this is an important heritage asset. The two mills are fairly unique, being a windmill and a tide mill together. Um, it's also a, a really important amenity for Haven't Borough. And this is not just the villages of Langston, but it's everybody around. Now, I have to say, and I'm not making a political point here, I am disappointed that our MP hasn't pitched up tonight because if, uh, 
if, if, if ever there was a situation where a community needs its member of parliament to fight, this is it. What we have here is a set of government agencies who are effectively playing top trumps with environmental designations. And their SSSI trumps our sink. Now, it was interesting actually hearing the point about friends of Norbarn Woods, who I know and uh, we'll, we'll get in touch with. But I think what's important here is to get the perspective that uh, we're talking about 200 meters of wall. Now, Chichester Harbour has 85 kilometers of seashore. So I don't really accept the argument that the impact of coastal squeeze against 200 meters of wall is significant in the grand scheme of the harbor. Now, I really appreciate um, the work that's being done by some of Haven Borough Council's officers, and I, I will single out coastal partners because I'm, with another hat on, closely aligned with work that they've been doing in Portsmouth. Um, but these people can't actually fight at an environment level without the support of the MP. We really need all of the support that the council and the officers can get from the top level. So it, it, it's disappointing that we're not represented by the MP tonight. Mr Chairman, there's a gentleman back here who I think is from the Friends of Norbarn Woods, am I right? Yeah, you may be able to add some knowledge. Thank you. Yes, my name is Roy Ewing. I'm the chairman of the Friends of Norbarn Woods. And it's true, between the period 2012 and 2016, we built 80 metres of shore protection. And we did it with the help of Haven Borough Council and Coastal Partners, and that worked very well. On the downside, we had to raise £80,000 to do it, but we managed it. And we did have a bit of an uphill struggle with the permissions from the Natural England, the Conservancy, Marine Management Organisation, etc. But we got there in the end. But if we can give you any help, any advice, we will do, because we're intimately connected, I think, with you. If you walk through Langston, you probably walk through Norbarn Woods, and vice versa. Thank you. All right, Pete Ricketts, I live in Haven. Ask, just for that chat there, how long did the permissions take? Can you, you didn't put a time scale on the touch. Difficult to say. A year or so. Okay, I'm just sort because of, as you say, just in wait a year, till this is finished. Like you're saying, a year might be too late. If we get a bad tide, then we've had it. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say is Portsmouth, down the Eastern Road, South Sea, obviously they're protecting houses. But the Eastern Road protection has been there for God knows how long. It's costing £160 million to repair all that. That sea that might just flood a little bit in there or go on the inlets in there is going to come up here. It's got nowhere else to go. If it's coming up and that tide is rising, it's going to come up here. £160 million spent down there. I'm sure a few thousand pound up here wouldn't be wasted, would it? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Lyle, do you, do you want to come back for a bit? Yeah. A couple of um, points of clarity there. Um, the work at North Port Sea Island is a £70 million scheme, and we're leading on that. The reason we can get permissions at North Port Sea Island down the Eastern Road is because we're protecting people and property. But legally, we have to provide compensatory habitat within the Solent for the losses of habitat for coastal squeeze. The water will not be displaced from um, Langston Harbour into Chichester Harbour. The water comes in through the entrances. The same amount of water comes in that goes out. 
Um, friends of Norban, oh, friends of Norban colleagues, it was a pleasure working with you um, where you raised a significant sum of money in order for the council to build those sea defences and get all the licence and consents in place. The licence consents, generally it's about 12 weeks to get through all the processes. The difference between then and now is the Natural England published a report a couple of years ago after we built Norban, um, which said Chichester Harbour is in a declining, unfavourable ecological environmental condition. So since then, that has um, meant Natural England are not going to allow us to do what we worked so successfully with, the Friends of Norban, to do what we did about 10 years ago from memory. Um, precedents, look up Colner Common in Chichester Harbour. This is the recent precedent that was set where a landowner tried to rebuild, maintain his, his seawall, um, went on appeal to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State did not allow them to maintain their seawall and rebuild their seawall, and it's the same scenario. Final point of order on this one, the wall around Langston Mill Pond, and I've been at Haven as an officer for over 30 years, the wall around Langston Mill Pond, and many of you walk it regularly, is in the same, not very good condition as it's been for 20 years. I can share your concerns about the condition of that wall, but the wall around the mill pond is an older wall, different construction to the single skin wall that's fallen over just to the northeast by the paddock, which is, is um, fronting the footpath that we're concerned about. So just some context, the wall around the mill pond is in the same poor condition. I think it's been in the same poor condition for 20 years. That's not to say it won't fall over to tomorrow. I hope it don't. I hope it's there for another 20 years. Hopefully there's a couple of points of clarity there. Okay, thank you. Um, it doesn't quite solve our problems, you might say. Um, <sighs> I think our anxiety is still the same. We're still very, very concerned that that dam or seawall, whichever you want to call it, uh, that is protecting the mill pond as distinct from the paddock uh, will go. And then with catastrophic effects in terms of loss of all the ecological stuff that Gemma told us about, and this could be a disaster. We're being, we're, I, I hate to say it, but we're being faced with what Peter described as a circular argument, and we're going round and round, and we need to know how to unpick this and how to break it. And it, it seems to me that um, Phil Monday's suggestions have a lot of validity, and if we can try and address some of those, maybe we should do that. I'm not sure that we've got any other positive suggestions. Say again. What Lyle is saying is wait for the outcome of the um, study that's been con um, asked for by the Chichester Harvard Conservancy, quite right. But also, it seems to me that we need to be looking a bit beyond that and things like the suggestion about trying to go higher up to government. Thank you. Alex Rennie has just said he's happy to go and speak to Al Alan Mack. Um, I think Phil's suggestion, we, sh we should find him in a public place and try and ask him to say something in a public space, but uh, we'll seek advice from our councillors as to what's the best way to do it. But if we can persuade Alan to go right up to the top and try and unpick some of the stuff from the top down rather than uh, what we're trying to do from the bottom up, maybe that would make a lot of sense. Perhaps we can talk about this separately. Sir. Sorry, Simon, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, my name's Simon, I, I live off Pink Lane. And, I'm and he was singing a minute ago. Um, we've all heard recently about the sycamore being cut down in the gap at Hadrian's Wall. It's been condemned as an act of ecological vandalism. If the mill pond disappears, I believe it would be equally an act of eco ecological vandalism. And our elected representatives need to take very seriously what they're hearing tonight at this meeting and convey that especially to our MP. And as we've uh, just heard, 
that uh, they will ask him to go and make representations at the highest level. So if the sycamore tree and Hadrian's Wall attracted that level of press, I think this particular cause would also attract that level of press attention because I think it's on the same scale. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Hope, 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 hope. Getting me steps in. I think Father Tom's done all the exercise he needs to for the night. Just, we may be coming to the last couple of questions, so. Yeah, just a very quick one. Um, Paul Jerome, just a local resident. I've lived here since I was 13. Uh, used to live at Langston, now live at Denville's. Um, our previous MP has now been elevated to the House of Lords. Is there any point in contacting him? Good point. Hi, my name's Chris. I'm from over the bridge at Hailing. Um, just a quick clarification. On one of Gemma's slides earlier, there was the, um, a chart of listing down the different authorities and a tick or a cross whether they um, supported the wall or whether they also were um, acknowledging the existence of the habitats. And on the ticks and crosses, I'm not sure we had a tick from Coastal Partners. Um, haven't seemed to be supporting both. When I, when I wrote down my notes, I don't believe Coastal Partners were actually seen on the slide as being supporting. Is that, was I, am I right or wrong? I, I, I very clarify that. Um, I, I don't think that was, I, I didn't think that was factually correct because the Coastal Partners is an arm of Hamburg Council. So if a ticket is saying yes for Hamburg Council, it should also be saying yes for Coastal Partners because they are our, uh, an arm of the council. Is it worth checking that slide just to make absolutely sure? Because I'm pretty sure that Coastal Partners and Haven't Council were saying opposite things. Thank you very much. Gemma, do you want to? No, no, Gemma doesn't want to say anything. That's fine. Thank you very much. Just, uh, just John Meacham from Hailing Allen. Um, I think even Alan Mack, um, in this turbulent time, can't be sure of his majority for the next election. Politicians react to the electorate in sufficient numbers. I think everybody today should take upon themselves to write an email or a letter to Mr. Mack saying that this is a very important matter and we, we insist he makes representations to the Environment Secretary on this matter so this can be the nonsense at the lower level can be overridden and he comes through with a clear decision to allow the rebuilding of the wall. <laughs> We, we really do need to wrap it up, but Peter needs to say at least one word, so no, no, come, come to it from here, Pete. Okay. I'm going to stop the meeting in five minutes, so we need, if there's a vitally urgent question, Peter, please try and help us. I would like to say to Alex, uh, is that the, uh, there seems to be a, a little disagreement about what the consent guide really means. And of course, we should take legal advice about that because the interpretation, you totally ignored what that advice said. And because you've interpreted it in one way, it's quite clear Actually, if you just read the words on that slide, you would know you are absolutely free to go ahead and grant yourself permission if you care to undertake that route. Now, and that's why we presented in the way we did to suggest a way forward which you're not embracing. And I think it would be far more cooperative of you if you did go down that route and explore the avenues we suggested. Because we're looking actually to support you and not really to be in conflict with you. So um, I, I want you to go away realising we've both said things which appear to say that we're on the same side and therefore 
if you won't seek uh, the legal authority, which you already have, we will go ahead and do so. But, but we think it's your job to do that and okay. not ours. So. No, don't. Polly. Uh, I'm Polly and I live in Langston and um, I'm married to a lifelong bird watcher and um, on his behalf, he can't be here, I want to say that we must not for a moment consider diverting the footpath to the north of the mill pond because yeah, it is yeah. one habitat. Last question, sir. Just, just an observation. Robin Davison, I'm from Hayling. I had a business in Havant and uh, used to frequent the uh, <coughs> pubs on Langston on many occasions and walk along the, the, the beach there. Um, I am fortunate enough to look out over Tornabury, where probably 20 years ago, um, the farmers all deposited large amounts of chalk to protect their own <coughs> land there much against the environmental agency's um, requirements. They were never seen to uh, be sued or um, charged on any uh, basis. It's still there now, and I think the environmental agencies now believe that it was probably the correct thing to do, although they were against it at the time. Okay. Liz, do you want to say anything or not? Don't have to, no, do you do? Do you want to say anything? Gemma? I've got the ecological assessment from Coastal Partners to say that the assessment Sorry, does not did you indicate want to say any features yeah, within the mill pond or surrounding area. I, if you, the stuff you told Richard Leslie, that's why I was hoping you'd say something to the designated harbour conservation sites mentioned above, caused by the fixed coastal defences. So my point that they're just applying generic advice and not looking at the detail of the site. Is still Thank, you. Thank you. Thank we, you. We have a last little report from uh, Councillor uh, Liz Fairhurst. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, two things, really. We haven't given up the fight. We're going to carry on but just to set, try and send you home with a little bit of good news, that the path round by the mill, which is actually degrading and getting smaller, yes, Beryl, it is getting very small. Um, Councillor Bowman and I are having a meeting on the 6th of October, where I hope we've got engineers who've already been and inspected it coming to tell us about how they're going to protect it and repair it. So, you know, it's not what we want, but it, it, it's good news in one way. So hopefully you'll go home thinking that we haven't given up. We are still fighting as much as we can. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much indeed. That that's really is good news. But that is only that little bit of the path next to the mill building itself. It is not the dam that we're worried about. So don't lose heart, is what Liz is saying to us. And please, 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 do all the things you've been asked to do, like email Alan Mack and all the rest of it. We'll try and think about the business case, the precedents, and the other stuff as well that has been suggested tonight. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to Father Tom for hosting us. It's a great pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you all again on Sunday at 9.30. <laughs> oh, dear.